Evil is back. The Drool King Lotor has returned with a dark energy that can destroy the galaxy. Our only hope? The Voltron Force, a team of five heroic pilots that control five awesome robot lions. When Lotor's monstrous road beasts attack, the lions come together to form Voltron, defender of the universe. Welcome Voltron fans, this is Mark Morell, your host for Let's Voltron, the official Voltron podcast. We're here for another exciting episode review of Voltron Force, and I have my co-host with me, Greg Tyler. Welcome, Greg. Hey, Mark Morell. Hello, Voltron fans across the universe. We're going to review an episode, not episode of review, uh, of Voltron Force, uh, the episode uh, Roots of Evil, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, how are you doing, Mark? I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, doing all right. Um, looking forward to chatting about uh, uh, how how bad roots can be. Um, I do not dye my hair, so I can't really say that my roots are particularly evil, uh, unlike the rest of the hair. But uh, it'll be fun to talk about these evil things. And we are inching ever closer to Voltron's 40th anniversary in September and the sixth Voltcon in October. What do you think about that? Yes, I can't wait for that. Yeah, exciting times. I, I, uh, yeah. I, it's one of those deals where you think, wow, 40 years. Where has the time gone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I look in the mirror. Oh, there's where it went. <laughs> <laughs> yep. There's a, there's amazing things that happen as you grow older and your body starts to tell you new things, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You can't stay up stupid late. Anymore, and yeah. get up stupid early the next day. <laughs> you can't, you can't have three bowls of cereal while you watch your cartoons like you used to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you do have hair growing out of that particular place that you didn't know before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why don't we start going over the episode review for Roots of Evil then? Yeah, why don't we do that? Um, this has been a, a long time in coming. We started trying to review all the Voltron Force episodes, I forget how many years ago. Uh, this is the fourth from last episode. So we might actually finish going through these by the end of 2024. Uh, right. um, but yeah, let's go ahead and jump in. This is Roots of Evil, the 23rd of the 26 episodes, uh, production number 123. Uh, this was written by Len Yuli. And we interviewed uh, Len back in 2020, May of 2020, in episode 197 of the podcast. That was a really fascinating uh, chat. Um, he's a very, just a fun person to talk with, very informative, and and what a talented writer. Um, so if you want to know more about Len Yuli, uh, feel free to check out that episode if you haven't already. Uh, this episode of Voltron Force premiered in on uh, April 4th of 2012. Um, it was directed, as all the episodes were, by John Delaney. Uh, the story was by Todd Garfield and Jeremy Corey, and Len Yuli did the, the writing honors. Um, the cast are basically the usual favorites. I'll spin through them very quickly. Ashley Ball plays Allura. Doran Bell Jr. plays Vince. Shannon Chan Kent is Laramina. Andrew Francis is Lance and Commander Cossack. Ron walks and returns to play Farmer Barmy. Mark Hildreth uh, plays Lotor and crew member. <laughs> Giles Panton is Keith. Ty Olson is Hunk. Vincent Tong is Daniel. Sam Vincent plays Pidge and King Alpha. Who plays Barmy? Uh, that would be Ron Halder, who also plays Mayhawks. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we start off on Planet Doom at night. We're starting from Mayhox's laboratory. Mayhox is watering a row of hanging plants growing in clear globe-shaped vessels. And he turns to see Lotor glowering at him. Glowering. Ooh. That's a, that's an episode you can only there. Are, that's a term you can only get from the script. And I, I should point out real quick that uh, we are grateful to World Events Productions uh, for sharing. Uh, the scripts of Voltron Force so that it, it uh, facilitates and informs our episode reviews. So thanks to uh, to Webb. Right. 
So in this particular script, by the way, there were several changes that we had to, you know, chop off certain areas. There were changes to some of the, the, the script writing and stuff like that. So changes to some of the order of things. So try to bear with us as we go through a lot of those things. Yeah, and this what we have access to is the third draft. So maybe this is the last one, maybe it isn't, but yeah, there are quite a few changes, as you said. Right. So Lotor starts off by telling Mayhox that he keeps him in his service for two reasons and two reasons only. To oversee the completion of your aggravatingly complex construction plan for Castle Doom, which is a foreshadowing of events to come, by the way. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> and to help me find a way to destroy Voltron. And he says that, please do not tell me that gardening has to do with either. <laughs> So Mayhawk says, my dear Lord, would it make you feel better to know that these globes contain seeds laced with Hagarium? Harvesting them will provide vast quantities of dark energy, which will make you even more powerful. And as he's saying that, some of the roots burst out of the globe that he's holding. And he says, still working out a few of the kinks. And then Lotor says, perhaps we should grow the Hegarium on some other planet rather than growing them on Doom. And Mayhawk says, funny, I'm always a few steps ahead of you. So that, of course, was the, the tale from the villain side. And as we switch over, we, we, we see we're on planet Eris at the Castle of Lions. And we're in a hallway where Larmina and Alora are talking to each other. And Alora is talking about what is called the People's Forum. Mm -hmm. It's it's an important erosion tradition. Okay. And Larmina reminds her she knows this. It's where the most humble citizen may seek assistance from the royal family. Alora's upset because she's late to it and she doesn't do this as often as she wants to do it because of her work with Voltron. Right. Okay. So as they come into the great hall where all the people are, all the citizens are, Alora says, thank you for all your, for your patience. And how may I assist you, sir? The first one in line. And uh, he says, I've been trying to meet you for weeks. It's about Barmy's farm, my farm, called Barmy's farm, because that's my name, Barmy. Yes, because he's a farmer, and, you know, we have to make him seem like a illiterate uh, something. This is the one thing about this episode that bothers me, is, is, yes, he is a farmer, and you know what? He doesn't have to talk like that. But yeah. he does. It, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So it, it kind of reminds me of the, the Beverly Hillbillies a little bit. Yeah, it's a little too on the nose. Yeah, a little bit a little, little bit uh, Jed Clampett or yeah. Jethro Clampett even. <laughs> yeah. Alora says, okay, Barmy, can you be a little bit more specific? And then you hear Keith coming over the comm like, Alora, we need you in the control room. And she says, can it wait? And Keith says, no, it's urgent. But then she 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 has to leave. So she says, I promise I will help you soon. And then Barmy says, soon's too late when the yim yams are reap, ripe for reaping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I should I'm gonna point out that Barmy, the reason why this is a return to uh, Barmy is that he originally appeared in an episode, well, I think this is back in the eighth episode, eighth or ninth, called Flash Form Go. Um and uh, I believe, I don't think he was actually named in that episode, but this is clearly the same character. So, yeah, so. Well, that was when uh, Volcanic Magma was threatening his farm. Right. So we actually saw Barmy's farm in that episode. Yep. So later that night, 
Alora takes a visit to Alfor's tomb. We haven't seen this in a while, right? Yeah, it has been quite a while. So uh, Alora says, Father, yet another day has passed with my failure to address the needs of the Erusian people. I care deeply about this responsibility, yet my equally important duty to the Voltron Force. And Alfor appears as a ghost and says, seems to pull you away. It is an honor to bear both of these responsibilities. However, perhaps it's time your people had a full-time queen instead of a part-time princess. And Alora says, but I can't be queen as long as I'm a member of the Voltron Force. And of course, Alfor just and smiles. And Alfor gives her a look. Yeah. yeah. He smiles knowingly like, well, it seems like you know what you have to do then, right? <laughs> That's right. What are your thoughts about this? Uh, I, I realize this is this is this whole scene has been with in the castle has been deliberately set up to make Alora realize she needs to focus on her people more. But the whole people's forum concept is is kind of fascinating because you know this is a, a planet that is ruled by a benevolent uh, monarch or you know, a, a princess who's not yet become queen. So, but she is effectively the one, the leader of the entire planet and all of its people. And this is sort of, I'm reminded a little bit of, of Queen Amidala in Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, where she's a queen, but she answers to the people in the sense that uh, there apparently are elections for queen on that planet. So how that works, I have no idea. But here, this is very much a royal family kind of deal. So I doubt there are elections, but I guess this is their way of telling us that uh, the the viewers that yes, she is a uh, you know a, a non-elected leader, but she's a good one. Darn it! <laughs> uh, Aris has seen a lot of strife. You know, uh, yeah. Aris has been through quite a bit over the years, uh, and as you come to learn during this episode alone, they talk about the the Zarconian Wars, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're going back to the days of King Zarkon and Doom and what they did to Aris when it was King Alfor. And, and now with Lotor and Mayhox and now Princess Alora. Right. So it always seems like they can't catch a break on Aris. Yeah, it's kind of unfortunate. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, wouldn't I mean, wouldn't you think that Mayhawks could have just said, you know, yeah, we we need to set up these seed pods or whatever on some other planet. Yeah, let's let's just pick like the planet Ebb or or one of those little planets you only see in one episode that the Voltron Force would probably never find out about. <laughs> How about that resort planet? Remember? Uh, what was that one called? Drayden. Yeah, Drayden, baby, Drayden. <laughs> Right. Yeah, maybe they even have a greenhouse on that planet somewhere, or some kind of a uh, a simulated rainforest or something where they could plant these things. You know, spare Eris for you know at least one week. <laughs> no, nah, it's got to be Eris. That's who. That's who they want to get. They 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 want to. Yeah, that's true. Destroy Eris. They want to destroy Voltron. And if they can do them in both in one fell swoop, that would be the best thing, right? That's I just. True. I'm just trying to figure out how bad did he think these plants were going to be? It's a great question. <laughs> I'm I'm just trying to figure that out. Did did he design them to be as bad as they can be or I don't know. They're not smart plants it doesn't look like. They just keep on extending and growing and that's all they do. Yeah, although there, the pa there's a passing reference to how bad they can be to the entire planet later in the episode, as we'll see. So it could be pretty darn bad. So uh, the next morning, Laura's lost in, in thought, and Larmina is trying to give her breakfast. So Larmina says, you missed yep. breakfast, and Laura says, huh? Oh, I wasn't hungry. And Larmina says, my aunt always tells me that a good day starts with a good meal. And then all of a sudden... Barmy comes in and says, and a good meal starts with clean hands and an empty bucket. <laughs> How does Barmy get in? So they both are startled by, by seeing Barmy there all of a sudden. 
And Larmina says, how did you get in here? And Barmy says, I uh, walked. And Larmina says, I meant past security. And Alora says, it's Barmy, right? And Barmy says, the princess remembered my name. And then Alora says, yes, well, Barmy, we don't usually hold the people's forum today, but I'm glad you're here and I'd be happy to listen to your concern. So Barmy says, concern, huh? It's an emergency. Barmy's farm has been overrun by, and then all of a sudden, they're shaking all over the place. It's like an earthquake. Objects are falling off the walls. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a, a, a ceiling fixture that falls, and, and Laura says, look out. And then as the shaking subsides, Keith runs through, stopping when he sees Alora, and Alora says, Keith, are we under attack? Keith says, no, Pitch says it was a quake. We need to start rescue operations. Come on, we got to get to the lions. And of course, once again, Alora says, I have to go. And then Barmy says, but what about Barmy's farm? And Alora says, Larmina, stay here and help Barmy with his whatever it is. And Larmina says, oh, that isn't fair. And then Barmy offers her a hoof chip. What's right, a hoof great. chip? That sounds wonderful. Uh, is it a chip made out of hooves of some Arusian animal? <laughs> I don't. <Ugh>. <laughs> I don't think I want to know. <laughs> so, yeah, Barmy, he uh, he definitely has a way of speaking. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. A, he also there has a way a of big... getting through security. So, this goes back to the whole, okay, and I realize... You know, there are only so many characters you can have and blah, 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 animation budgets and everything else. But if she is a sovereign ruler of the planet and she has this people's forum, I, I, are there, I mean, again, where are the administrators? Where are, where's anybody except the Voltron force and the cadets ever? Right, you know, like you know who, what I mean. Who I mean, were the what, who were the people that gathered all the the citizens from Aris to come to the People's Forum? Yeah, do they launch the lions to do that? I mean, or do they just yeah, open yeah, the mean, doors and like, say today's you... today's People's Forum day? So just the doors are open. I, yeah, I don't... yeah, I just have to know that. Or does she go on the space radio and and have a little uh, you know like a a speech like a fireside chat or something like FDR do, used to do. Uh, I don't know. But, and, and it's like, how did Barmy get past security? Where is security? <laughs> I think it's pretty easy to get past security. <laughs> when you never see them. Right. That's right. As the Voltron members are, are running through the hallways, Daniel says, so who am I riding with? And Keith says, not today, Daniel. We we need you here. Find Larmina and work with her to secure the castle. So he just says, yes, sir. And then um, outside in the courtyard, Larmina is with Barmy, and Barmy is with his hover wagon. Mm-hmm. It's got to be a wagon, but it's we're in the future, so it has to hover. This, this <laughs> is where it says right in the script, Think Beverly Hillbillies meets the Jetsons. <laughs> yep, there, there's the Clampett reference. I'm just amazed that, that he didn't uh, that he didn't let Daniel and Larmina play in his cement pond in his backyard. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's a Beverly Hillbillies reference, everybody. <laughs> right. So he he starts up the hover wagon. It sputters, and Larmina's just watching, bored. And Barmy says, this old thing's fussier than a preen hawk in springtime. Who knows what a preen hawk is? I don't know. I, I, but I will say, I do love sci-fi movies and shows when they reference alien stuff. You know, I mean, it happens in Star Trek all the time. Uh, you know, other shows will have their uh, futuristic swear words like uh, Frill from Farscape or, uh, you know, you know what I mean? I, I just think that kind of stuff is fun. Yeah, even in, uh, I think it was the Avengers, um, Thor was talking to Agent Coulson, and he talks about Bilge Snipe or something like that. And, you know, of course, Agent Coulson doesn't have any idea what it is because it's from his home world. 
and he says they're just disgusting creatures, you know, and <laughs> that's that's it. I mean, you really don't know about these things, especially if if they reference it and nobody questions them about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like Star Wars and it's uh, uh, scruffy looking nerf herders or it's gun darks or it's crate dragons. I mean, you know, Womp you know. rats. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So Larmina says, please take your time. I have nothing more important to do. And Daniel crosses over and says, hey, what's going on? And Larmina says, I'm leaving with Barmy here to see whatever's up at his farm. And Daniel says, Keith told me to work with you to secure the castle. And Larmina says, except I'm not going to be here. And then Daniel starts to grin and he says, well, then it seems I can't work with you and secure the castle. So I guess I'll have to make an executive decision. And who's he going to secure the castle from, Barmy? <laughs> 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 that's, that's the only person who's broken in so far and he's leaving. That's true. So, so you might as well yeah. go with him. So they jump on the hover wagon and they take off. Now we're inside the black lion cockpit. Keith scowls as a red concentric circle props up on a map. And Keith says, we have a stage one alert at the Kazurai dam. Hit it. You know about what okay. the the Go Kazurai Dam is. I do, and and this this reference is an insanely deep cut, and the reason why it's an insanely deep cut is that it references the title of an episode of Voltron: Defender of the Universe. It does not reference anything that is explicitly named in the episode itself. I mean, you 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 could have watched the entire '80s show a hundred times every episode. If you didn't know the episode titles, which were never displayed in the episode, this reference would go totally over your head. So this is you have to know the episode titles. And so, <clears throat> the Kazurai Dam is a reference to uh, Lion Force's 16th episode called "Bridge Over the River." Kazurai, which is itself a reference, of course, to the film "Bridge Over the River Kwai." But uh, they're in the script. The script doesn't even reference this. There's no, not even in the uh, the script of that episode. It doesn't even reference it other than the episode title. But there is a legend in that episode about a love bridge that that bridges two kingdoms together. And presumably that bridge goes over the same river that this Kazurai Dam referenced in this episode probably goes over. But talk about a deep cut. That's that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so probably a Jeremy Corey reference. Uh, that's that's exactly what I was thinking. That had to be Jeremy that threw that in there. Oh yeah. Okay. Basically, there's water spewing out of the dam at different parts of the dam, and you can see it's starting to fall apart. So Keith says, "Pidge, Laura, you're with me on rescue detail. Hunk and Lance handle the repair." So Lance says, no sweat. Hunk says, we'll do. All right. So Yellow Lion places three paws against the dam wall to support it. The water jets spewing from the cracks grow to a deluge. And then Hunk says, anytime, Lance. And Red Lion descends, facing the dam, unloads a magma blast. And then a cloud of steam results. It dissipates. And the combination of the molten rock and the rushing water has formed a smoldering seal. So Lance says, just a little magma seal, no big deal. So basically it's fixed. All right. Yeah, so yeah. And didn't they do something similar with uh, Barmy's farm when all that stuff was going on? Except they, they used they used three different lions to I was gonna say, didn't they dig a ditch uh, in front of the mm -hmm. farm and the, the magmas did there, and then they used uh it was either water or something to turn it into like rock yeah and they wound up basically uh cooling it down they're cooling down the mag the the lava or whatever and they made a big deal that uh, they were they had a really a, a, a sort of oblique reference to the band earth wind and fire based on the powers of their three lions which you know what do we have we got these different abilities a really cool band name <laughs> yeah so yeah so barmy's been uh barmy's had his bacon saved uh, directly or indirectly by a lot of uh, Voltron action. 
<laughs> right. So they're all uh, sitting back at the uh, the base of the dam, I guess it is, where they're all just standing around. Yeah. And I think so. they're just conferring with each other. And Pidge says, okay, Vince and I have compiled some data. This was no ordinary quake. And Vince says, something's spreading underground, almost like fingers. Pidge says, and then there's high levels of Hagarian. He says, we better go underground. Hunk says, time to play in the dirt. Let's start digging. And then Alora says, there's a faster way, the old tunnel system the Erusians built during the Zarconian Wars. And that's where I mentioned from before. So this, this huge round hatch, like a missile silo, and it looks like it's rusty from years of neglect. It noisily opens and the lions leap in one after another to probe the depths of Eris. So what did you think about that? This, these tunnels that have never been mentioned before in any of the other episodes. Um, it's conceivable. I mean, there is a backstory of conflict with uh, Planet Doom. I think it's fun that the tunnels are big enough for robot lions. That's a little... It's another one of those... It's like that episode where the, where, uh, the lions went to... Um, the moon of Tarsus where Wade had a lab and he had captured Koran and you just see the lions walking around in this passage. Like it's just people walking in a hallway. And, right. and this, this is one of those, Oh, they're tunnels, but they're really, really big for the lions. Yeah. Um, so it makes you wonder what would, the, if they were trying to make these things secretly and get around secretly, wouldn't you want smaller tunnels? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So when you talk about the scale and what can fit in certain things. Yeah, they, they went big. They did. Um, so um, I will, I just want to point out just to, you know, keep my geek cred going. Uh, this is only the second reference to King's Ar or the only third, the third reference to King's Archon in the entire show, this entire show. And I think it's the last one in this whole show. Um, we saw a statue of Zarkon back in uh, Joyride to Doom. Uh, there was a reference to a band called the Zarconian Freaks in the episode Inside the Music, and then now we've got the Zarconian Wars. So, uh, go, go Zarkon. <laughs> Daniel and Larmina are now on the hover wagon, and, of course, it's still, like, backfiring and chugging along. And Barmy's telling a story. He says this... Then this fella shows up and gives me what he said was magic seeds, so I planted them. <laughs> and and of course, this is like uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, right? Yeah, wouldn't that have been cool if they if they if they'd made a beanstalk and he climbs to the top and there's a row beast living up there? <laughs> yeah, I mean this this whole episode is like a a, a really uh, like a horror movie of Jack and the Beanstalk. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. So um, Larmina is saying to uh, Daniel, hey, something wrong? And Daniel says, no, I'm fine, just a little itchy. He's gripping his arms and gritting his teeth. So you can tell maybe the Hagarium is getting to him. Yeah, yeah. So then we see uh, in the Green Lion cockpit, don't forget that they're in these tunnels now, Pidge is steering Green Lion down a steep winding tunnel. Uh, he's got Vince with him. Of course, nobody knows about the mental connection that uh, Daniel and uh, Vince have together, except for Larmina. So right, none right. of the Voltron Force members know about that telepathy. But Vince is talking to Daniel through the telepathy, and he says, Daniel, are you okay? And Daniel says, dude, I'm fine. And then Larmina says, what, what's going on? Daniel says, uh, oh, nothing. Vince was just checking in. And Larmina says, uh-uh, no fair. You don't get to escape with your weird telepathy thing. You need to keep your mind with me and babbling bar me over here. So this, this is the I first time that we've heard her mention about the telepathy thing because she found out about it at the end of the previous episode. Right. And they actually, uh, yeah, that connection was established in the episode. Was it I Voltron? 
Is that's yeah, that was the one where uh, uh, yeah he 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 had the little thing on his head and had his brain transferred into Voltron and Vince used his 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 Voltcom magic to get Daniel's brain out or his mind out and and they they had a link from that point onward. Right. She she nods in the direction of Barmy and you zoom out to include Barmy and then you see um, where Barmy is saying. Then it hit me. Those seeds might be why that evil tree is stealing my livestock. And Armina says, a what's doing what? And Barmy says, well, what would you call it? As he points ahead and you see this tree and there's parts of the tree that are holding livestock. Yeah, Arusian cattle. Right. So what you see then is the branches reaching out towards the hover wagon. And as we see that, well, there's also an area in the tunnels uh, where you see uh, roots snaking down towards the pilots in the tunnel, right? Yep. And then you see Hunk saying, uh-oh. So it's happening above and it's happening below. And that's when the yeah, end of Act sure 1 wonder. happens. Yes, so it does make you wonder, are they connected? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how they like to do split screens, and of course they did a split screen where they showed above the, the ground and below the ground. Yeah. Okay, so Act 2 starts in the same same areas, uh, below the cavern and at, at Barmy's farm. The pilots below are trying to get away from these roots that are coming at them uh while barmy says see something about this just doesn't seem right like he's an older guy he's a farmer he's very experienced and it takes him this long to figure out that something might be wrong because a tree giant tree is attacking them and his cows yeah he doesn't get yeah. excited about anything in this whole episode <laughs> no nah, just just give him some hoof chips and he'll be happy yeah I'm wondering what's in those hoof chips mm. <laughs> that keeps him so calm. Yeah. And how did he get those past security? <laughs> so Barmy's getting chased by these branches. And before it can grab him, Larmina leaps in front of him and swats the branch away with her staff. And Larmina says, you think? And Daniel says, Larmina, get clear. Larmina looks at Daniel, realizes his plan, uh, quickly tackles Barmy out of shot as Daniel aims his fists and fires his speed claw projectiles. So from his claws, he's sending out all these projectiles from the claws, and the branch shatters and bursts into shreds. Okay, so meanwhile, in the cavern, uh, the teammates are firing up their Voltcon weapons, Keith crosses his sword, slices a root with a scissor move. Alora fires an arrow to split a vine. Uh, Lance has his pistols out. And then they're each knocking down these roots one after another. But then Keith says, there's too many. Get back to the lions. So they all go back to their lions. And they they start to take off in the in the lions. And then the lions are starting to go after these roots. Yeah. The tree is uh, a lot more aggressive downstairs than it is upstairs, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. At least I at mean, this I point. Mean, if Daniel can hold it off. Yeah, at this point. Right. In the green lion cockpit, uh, Pidge is, is making green lion bash encroaching roots with a shield. But you pan to Vince, and he's got this mental link. And from his point of view... You see Daniel's point of view superimpose over that, and it's a jerky handheld image of Larmina lifting Barmy to his feet and facing the camera. And Larmina saying, I definitely do not like that tree. So Daniel's point of view pans to the tree and it lets go of the erosion cows. They moo as they descend, but at the last second, they squawk like a chicken and wings flap out, fluttering madly, allowing them a soft landing. I think him, I think the cows turning into chickens doesn't happen in the finished episode. I think that's isn't that just a script thing? Yeah. It is yeah. just a script thing. Yeah, which is hilarious. 
And it also reminds me of a, a brilliant 1990s cartoon called uh, Cow and Chicken. But, uh, you know, well, that's beside the point. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, all these images are happening in, in Vince's head. Uh, yeah. And so the, in addition to that visual, which is not in the finished episode of the cows sprouting wings and squawking, there's a line from Barmy, which is funny and disturbing at the same time. Barmy says, and again, only in the script, not in the finished episode. Glad I crossbred my bovine and chickers. One stop milk and eggs. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to, I do not want to know how that got to happen. <laughs> so you can imagine if, if your cows that give milk morph into chickens that give eggs. Wow. Who needs Voltron if you have cows that can turn into chickens? Well, you still have to clean up after both of them, right? <laughs> yeah, what's that mess look like? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at one point, Vince says, uh, Pidge, and Pidge is a little busy, and he says, a little busy right now, Vince. But Vince says, yeah, sorry, but just got a, a text message from Daniel. Yeah, he and Larmina are under attack. And Pitch says, from what? And Vince says, a giant evil tree? <laughs> and then you look in the, the, the blue lion cockpit, and Laura is firing an ice blast, and she blinks and brings Vince up on a holographic comm screen and says, where, in the castle? And Vince says, uh, no, I think they're on a farm. And Laura says, no, I should have... And and she she gets cut off, and then Pitch says, "Amazing satellites show that we're directly under a farm, and that the roots we're fighting lead right up to a tree." Mm, maybe they are connected. <laughs> <laughs> I bet even Barmy could have figured this one out. And then Pitch says, "And it gets worse." And then on a split screen with Lance and Pitch, Lance says, "It always gets worse with you." Pitch says, hey, don't shoot the messenger who's about to tell you that this root system is also burrowing down to the core of Aris. So like you were saying, it if it just keeps on growing and growing, where does it go? Well, it's going right towards the core of Aris, which could destroy the planet. No big that's deal. one heck of an evil tree. Yeah, yeah that's something. <laughs> so then Keith says, that explains the quakes. And Vince says, but if the roots reach the core, Pitch says the chaotic Hegarian power could rip Aris apart. You, you know, the one thing that Mayhawks did wrong in this plan, he shouldn't have made it a tree. He should have made it a dandelion plant. Because <laughs> you cannot get rid of those damn things. Yeah. yeah. You, I mean, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, a tree can die on its own sometimes without any human intervention, but a dandelion. <laughs> if we would have called this weed of evil, do you think people would have seen a double meaning in that? Uh, no, I don't know what you're talking about, Mark. <laughs> so maybe that's why it was called Roots of Evil and it's a tree instead of a weed. Okay, we can go with that. <laughs> okay. So Laura says, not on my watch, not ever. And the blue lion's freeze tail unloads and forms a solid ice wall to stop the, the roots from extending. And then she says, follow me. Well, of course, the roots break through the ice wall eventually. As they're going through the, the, the cavern floor, they, they're continuing their descent into the caverns more. Um, in the blue lion cockpit, uh, she steers Blue Lion down, down. There's a single tear on her cheek. And then Keith says, Alora, I haven't seen you that charged like this before. Are you? She wipes the tear away, and, and Alora says, I'm fine, Keith. Keith says, look, I know you've been feeling torn between. And Alora says, Keith, I don't want to discuss it. And Keith says, all right, but just know that every time you have made the right choice, Voltron needed you. And Alora said, that's not the point. If I'd given that farmer the time he deserved, this never would have happened. So 
there's there's another section here that gets completely cut out from the finished episode, right? Right. So at one point there was a a, a thing where Alora and Lance were going back and forth, and uh, while in the tunnel, uh, the the roots would have violently pierced the tunnel walls and then grab Blue, Blue Lion. And Keith would say, let's go, let go of her. Anyway, um, we didn't see any of that. I think, I think grabbing Blue Lion and getting rescued was in there. <clears throat> but the line was changed. Keith's line was changed to Alora instead of let go of her. Um, so the action happened, but the exchange between Lance, where Lance tries to make light of, he basically, uh, uh, throws a joke in while Allura is uh, very seriously contemplating her <laughs> near future. Um, uh, well, that's that because they, they that cut episode. out the, the last part of the line from Allura. So his line yeah, wouldn't yeah. have made sense. Right. So let's, let's just go ahead and we, we've kind of talked around it. Um, Allura uh, originally in the finished episode, she says, uh, if I had given that farmer the time he deserved, this never would have happened. But in the script, it says, if I'd given the farmer the time he deserved, it, I could have nipped this in the bud. And then Lance says, bud, that's a plant joke, right? And then there's a little bit more back and forth. But it was just another attempt to drop in some humor, uh, probably in an ill-placed uh, part of the show. So it was cut. Yeah. So what we then see is Yellow Lion skids to a halt as a huge Venus flytrap type plant bursts out of the ground with its jaws snapping and then Hunk says, oh, clam it, buttercup. And Yellow immediately pivots, smacks the flytrap upside the head with its hammer tail, and it kneels over and knocked out. I, I just feel bad that the thing didn't say, feed me. See more, right? Yeah, exactly. Little little yeah, shop yeah. of horrors there. Right. So, so yeah, you, you have a little bit of Beverly Hillbillies. You have a little bit of Jack and the Beanstalk. You have a little bit of Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> so, yeah. We're, yeah. Lots of references. Yeah. And Lance says... And the Kazurai Dam. We can't forget that. Oh, right. And and the Kazurai Dam. Right. So Lance says, is that the best you got? And then Pitch says, those thorns are made of Hagarium. They'll cut red to ribbons. But as the thorns are launching out of the vines like darts, Red Lion throws up a wall of fire and it basically fries them in mid-flight. And then Lance says, thanks for the tip, Pidge. Yeah, I, I do hope that that was an intentional pun because Pidge is warning him about thorns, and then Lance says, thanks for the tip. I do like that. Yeah. Uh, Lance says, are we done yet? And Alora says, all of you, hover mode now. And then she yells, freeze tail. So her tail has a freeze beam, right? So what she does is they all go up into hover mode. Uh, she does a flash freezing of the bottom of the tunnel where the roots are. The roots stiffen and get immobilized in the ice. And then Laura says, okay, let them drop. And everyone's jets switch off and they go out of hover mode and they just slam to the ground and break up all the yeah, ice and the roots. Cool. Yeah. That was cool. I like when the lions do things other than fire laser beams and torches and all that stuff. I like the I, I just like the brute force of them landing and smashing them up. Right. So Lance is very cool, and Alora says only it doesn't stop them for long. And Keith says, "Still, your cold weapons are the best way to kill those roots." And Pidge says, "So if we could form Blue Center Voltron, Alora could have enough power to put that tree on ice for keeps." And Alora says, we need a bigger cave. This tunnel's too small for Voltron. Come on. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, where she says, we need a bigger cave. You already said, wow, that cave's big enough to hold all the lions. Where are they going to get a bigger cave <laughs> to actually I, form I don't, I don't Voltron know, yeah. and change to Blue Center? Yeah. Are there enough erosions left on the planet to build a bigger cave? I mean, so I was nerdy enough during the uh, the scene with the People's Forum to count the number of erosions that were in the castle, 
there were only 20. I mean, obviously not counting Alora or Larmina. So is this a regular enough occurrence that no one really needs help on the regular? Or are there so few people on this planet, as there often seems to be, that maybe these are the only people left? Wow. I don't know. So back on Barmy's farm, Larmina shoves Barmy into a crouch behind a stone wall. Larmina says, now stay right here, okay? And Barmy says, what are you going to do? And Larmina says, I have to go find, and then she says, Daniel? So at the, at the moment, Daniel is waging a one-man war against the tree. He's wildly trading punches with the grasping branches, and his eyes intermittently shine with the Hegarium glow. So, you know, he's got the Hegarium infection. He's got the touch. He's got the power. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Transformers, a movie reference. Sorry. Yeah. So Larmina behind the wall, she kneels and taps her comm link and she says, Vince, Vince says, I can't talk right now. And then Larmina says, then just listen, Daniel's acting weird. I mean, more than usual. So what you see then is there's this quick flash and Vince starts having a, a flashback to a previous episode. I think it's yep, reused, reused footage from episode 21. Yep, I Voltron. Yeah. So that, that's where he got the uh, infection the first time. Right. I was just gonna I was just gonna say I remember very vividly not making this connection quickly when this episode first came out. Because in I, Voltron, uh, the Wade, Kala, Spider, Lighter, Splider, Splion, whatever you want to call it, Robeast, um, injected Dantron, which was Voltron with Daniel's mind operating it. There was, in, in, my, in my mind, in my Voltron mind space, there was no obvious clue that this would have affected Daniel beyond his time in Voltron. To me, there was no obvious clue. Yeah. We, we saw him uh, be a little, I think, a little bit susceptible to Hagarium in the next episode, uh, Cross Signals, I think it was. But that was a really subtle thing. And for them to wait two episodes after an, after an event that really isn't an obvious uh connection between the uh, spider lighter thingamajig and Daniel. I, I really found this difficult to put together in the context of an action scene. And this really kind of slipped past me the first time through. Do you remember what you thought back then? No, I just, I, it's, it's, I, I think it's a, a thing to let the audience know. If you didn't know from before, when we showed this episode, now you'll know because this is where he actually got the Higarium infection. Yeah. It's it's just weird to me that it was it was done so quickly in this episode yeah. that even even this right in your face line from Vince doesn't in my mind it just happened so quickly that I I missed it the first time through is all I'm saying. Yeah. So so the the line that you're talking about Vince says, no, Larmina, Daniel was infected with Hagarium when he was cocooned with that spider thingy. The concentrated Hagarium levels in that tree must be causing him to have flare-ups. Yeah. I mean, especially because the flashback is from two episodes ago where it wasn't obviously Daniel the whole time. Daniel's mind was in Voltron. So even the visuals in this con in this quick scene are kind of jarring and confusing, I think. Right. Don't forget that Vince is still in Green Lion with Pidge. And Pidge yeah, hears him talking. <laughs> and he says, what did you say? And Vince says, me? Oh, nothing. <laughs> and then Vince whispers to Larmina, get Daniel away from the tree before we lose him altogether. So Larmina's going after Daniel. She says, Daniel, Daniel. And then... Larmina extends her staff, pole vaults over one, kicks aside the second, 
Then she does a shoulder roll and lands behind Daniel. And she goes, Daniel. And Daniel says, ah, oh, hi, Larmina. So Daniel's still doing, you know, some crazy fighting moves. And Larmina says, Daniel, you have to get away from that tree. The Hegarium in it will make you sick. Daniel says, what are you talking about? I can handle this. So it's 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 almost like, I don't know, he's like he's taking some heroin or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's 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 a uh, he's very hyper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Very hyper. So uh, the tree stands under some low clouds. There's a great crackling sound, like a time lapse movie of a blooming flower. The tree suddenly starts sprouting enormous fruit. So now we're into like. The pods from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. You're next. You're next. Yeah. And I and I gotta say, the sound effects associated with these pods and action that happens later, there's some pretty pretty gross sound effects uh, with some of this material here. Uh, some of these pods and the stuff inside. I don't know how they recorded that stuff. I seem to remember uh, Jeremy Corey mentioning that there were some stories behind some of those sounds, but I don't know what those were. <laughs> yeah. Like, like hands reaching into a whole bowl, a big, huge bowl of macaroni and cheese. Is that something you remember him saying? I, I, I think, I, think that, I remember them saying that. Okay. Imagine, okay. That, that imagine the sound that, that, of that, hands that. reaching into a big bowl of macaroni and cheese. That sounds about right, and it's uh, a lot, lot less disgusting than uh, where my mind <laughs> could uh, could go. Okay, so Daniel says these tree buds are dripping hegarium, and Larmina says, "What else can go wrong?" And then the pods peel open like the eggs in Alien, the Alien movies, and they start to ooze some kind of sap. And of course, Larmina like, says, "I have to ask." <laughs> All right. So then uh, what we see is if you go up in the sky, you see a ship where jewel soldiers are coming out of it. They have uh, siphon backpacks drop out from cargo doors. They land in the branches and begin siphoning the glowing goo. So they're basically harvesting the Hegarian. Yeah. So... There are drool soldiers harvesting Hagarium as the tree is growing above the planet. I guess that's, I guess the plan is the drools are harvesting Hagarium from above the surface of the planet. While, oh, by the way, the roots are growing down toward the core of the planet to destroy the planet at the same time. It's actually kind of clever as, as Mayhawks' plans go. Yeah. And this is why they didn't grow this stuff on Doom because it would have done the same thing to Doom, even though they would have been able to get the Hegarium, it would have had a, a, a nasty effect. Yeah, yeah. So Barmy says, hmm, looks like it's harvest time, and that's the end of Act 2. Right. Okay, so we're back to the drools continuing to vacuum up all that glowing goo. Daniel is still... Yeah, they, they almost look like alien proton packs from Ghostbusters. Oh, there you go. There you go. So Daniel says, let's get him. And Larmina says, hey, I like kicking drool butt as much as the next guy, unless the next guy has Hegarium poisoning. Daniel says, but I don't have... And then Larmina grabs his shoulders, looks him in the eye and says, listen, Daniel. You're as much of a danger to yourself and to me as you are to the drools. Wow, I sound like my aunt. <laughs> and Daniel says, Larmina, I am totally in control. And then he does another twitch, breaks free and runs off. And he's screaming as he's running away. And Larmina says, oh yeah, major self-restraint. So Daniel speed claws up the trunk of the, the tree, and then Larmina stumbles over to climb after him, and she says, Daniel. And then Daniel hears a tree branch crack, turns and shoots his claws right at Larmina. She fan spins her battle staff to deflect 
to, to deflect it. And she says, hey, I'm on your side, remember? And then Daniel says, oh, Larmina, I'm sorry. I didn't think. And Larmina says, that's what I've been saying. Now let's get off this tree before. And then there's another tremor, throws them off where they are. Uh, Larmina's falling. She jams her staff into the tree trunk like a flagpole and stops abruptly. And Daniel drops and grabs her boots. So they're both hanging there from her 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 staff holding in the tree. And then he's still got the, the claws on and she goes, ow, ow, watch the nails, will you? And then he turns off his claws. Hmm. So then we go back, we go back to the uh the bunker, the underground bunker. And we've got a split screen with Lance and Alora. And Lance says, so this is where the civilians waited out the Zarconian Wars. And Alora says, they sacrificed so much for the future good of Aris. I want to interject something real quick. Um, we did see caves in the earliest Lion Force episodes of Voltron Defender of the Universe. Um, I think it was a Ghost in Four Keys or one of those really early episodes where, um, you know, the space explorers have landed on Eris and, you know, they, they encounter caves with erosions in them and they're very hesitant to come out of the caves and, and help the, the, the future Voltron force and Pidge actually winds up, um, going into the caves for a time as well. And so there is a precedent for underground stuff that the Erusians hang out in. Um, I just wanted to point that out. Even though the tunnels weren't referenced or seen in Voltron Force until this episode, if you buy into the 80s show being a, uh, a you know, like a backstory for this show, then there is uh, a precedent for this. Yep. Now the room begins to rumble, and then Keith says, they're coming, we need to form Voltron now. So they're forming Voltron in this huge, huge cavern, right? So he says, activate interlocks, dinotherms connected, infracells up, mega thrusters are go. They all say, let's go, Voltron Force. And then Keith starts to say, form arms. And, and then Hunk says, wait, Keith, me and Pinch have worked up something that'll help. You might want to go yellow. So says Keith says, all right, yellow center formation it is. Form yellow center. And then they form yellow center Voltron just as an overwhelming horde of roots smashes through the ceiling and the walls. In the yellow cockpit, Hunk smiles fiendishly, he reaches down, pulls a rip cord with the, from, from low on the dash, and he says, let's rip it up. So there's like this I, I want to point out something. Yeah. Like where, Vol where Black Center Voltron's wings would be, yeah. there's like a, a pair of, cir of uh, chainsaws. And they not only have chainsaws on them, the the hubs where they mount to Voltron's back, they they spin about those hubs. So they're spinning and sawing at the same time. But I, I thought it was cool that he like pulled a cord and it's like turning on either a chainsaw or a weed whacker or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I love that. I think that's awesome. Um, I, I do want to nerdily point out that in the script, this sequence is uh is a little bit different and and it's you know, knowing that animation costs money, the changes from the draft we have to the finished episode are clearly for budgetary reasons. Um, in this episode, we see Keith walking through the regular formation sequence and Black Center Voltron is nearly formed. And that's when Hunk interrupts him and says, let's do Yellow Center. This allows them to reuse the clip of Black Center Voltron, you know, segueing into yellow center voltron it's it's one of my favorite shots from the hook yard um because you actually see the lions in alignment and then black and yellow switch places um it, as scripted um keith is about to order blue center formation and then hunk gives the whole line about hey let's go yellow and keith says yeah let's do it and then they, they Yellow Center Voltron, activate interlocks, blah, blah, blah. This would have required the animation of a, a straight yellow center formation from Lions to Voltron, which they had only done with black and red centers to this point and only ever did with those two centers. So this was clearly a, a money-saving thing 
by having them reuse that older footage. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out, that things were a little different in script. Sorry about that. All right. Back to the chainsaws. <laughs> so with these whirring wings, you know, it, it's able to to move around the room and and basically chop all these roots, right? Mm -hmm. So he kind of leans with one shoulder, chops those roots, and then leans with another shoulder and chops those roots. And Voltron completes its run around the bu bunker, stands surveying the dismembered roots, and Hunk says, and now we have a fallback career in landscaping if, if this whole defending of the universe thing doesn't work out. I got news for you, Hunk. If the whole defending of the universe thing doesn't work out, you're not going to have another job. <laughs> uh, you're not going to have anything. You're going to be done. You're done. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be bad. I guess he could play rock. He could write rock and roll music when he's in a drool prison or something. Right. So then uh, another wave of roots breaks through the walls. Pidge's sensors are going crazy, and he says, sorry, pal, I don't think tree trimming's going to cut it this time. And he says, Vince, we need more power. Vince, uh, you know, he starts to do his magic. And All right, here's what happens in the script, and then we'll talk about what happens in the episode. Because what happens in the episode is actually really confusing. But what happens in the script is uh, Pidge says, sorry, pal, I don't think trimming is going to cut it this time. We need a permanent shield, Keith. Keith orders forming green center. Yeah, that never and happens. Then, yeah, then Pidge says form boomerang shield. And then a force field sort of, uh, Pidge, uh, Vince supercharges the boomerang shield. And a force field is projected from the shield. So that's what happens in the script. Now what happens in the finished episode is the same thing, except they never form green center. So if you look very carefully in the episode, it's yellow center Voltron, and, and it's holding the boomerang shield above its head, so it's formed with no one summoning it, and it's being formed by yellow center Voltron, and the force field comes out from that. So this is the second time in this episode when something is visually really confusing, and it's all to save money because, again, the there's only one formation sequence that's ever seen in the series when they form Green Center. It's that really weird one where you see Green Lion's Voltron head pop up out of the torso. Yeah. It, it, going back to inside the music, unlike all the other Voltrons where you see the, the head, the lion head flipped down, the mouth open. Uh, in this episode, in that episode, and, and it's reused when they fight the Predator Robies. The head of Voltron, Green Center Voltron, just emerges through the torso of Voltron. That's the only sequence we ever had. So, to, to again, to prevent having to do a brand new animation for this one scene, they cut changing to Green Center and still, for some reason, had the boomerang shield appear and then the force shield pop out. They could have made the force shield appear out of any part of Voltron and made that less visually confusing. But there you go. Okay. So in the green cockpit, Vince faints. Pidge rushes over and says, Vince, you okay? Vince says, yeah, that just drained me a bit. Now, there's a split screen with Keith and Lance, and Keith says, that force field should keep the roots from getting to the core. And Lance says, so, so we're done, right? Do yeah, so what do you think about that? They form a force field and, oh, core is safe. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> That's really anticlimactic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So at the same time, they added Alora to the split screen. She's listening to her comm link. And she says, no, it sounds like there's still trouble on the surface. So those drool harvesters are still working on harvesting the Hagarium. Daniel climbs over Larmina, stepping on her head as he goes. And she gets, she says, Daniel, what are you doing? And Daniel says, come on, you cowards, come and get us. What are you waiting for? So you see a couple of drools fall past her. You didn't see what Daniel did to make that happen, but um, she flips around her staff like a gymnast on the high bar, kicks them off. She says, sorry, losers. And she knocks out two of them. She says, I don't hang with your crowd. 
And then suddenly the tree shudders. Larmina shouts out, Daniel, we have to jump. Daniel says, ha, I never run away from a fight. And then Larmina somersaults up. She lands facing him, shoves him in the chest. His arms are pinwheeling. He falls backwards. And she says, then you'll fall from one. And then Daniel says, why do you, why'd you do that after they're both on the ground? Does she ever get to answer him? Yeah, we see the tree begin to actually start walking around. It's, it's, it disconnects from the roots, which apparently have been thwarted by the confusing boomerang shield force field thingy that Voltron made. And now this thing is a mobile, effectively a rogue beast or a monster. Like Godzilla. Yes. And it's at this point that I should point out that there was an episode of Defender of the Universe that had a tree row beast, and that was from the episode called Zarkon is Dying. So it looked a lot different than this one, but uh, Voltron has fought tree row beasts before. <laughs> so this is like Treebeard from the second Lord of the Rings movie, The the Two Towers? or it uh, could, yeah. Or it could be Groot from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes, I just rewatched the entire Lord of the Rings extended edition trilogy and the theatrical cuts of the Hobbit trilogy all within the last few weeks. And uh, so, yes, uh, the ends are very fresh on my brain. <laughs> okay. The evil tree stops after Larmina and Daniel, but as they flee, the ground begins to rumble. The tip of Voltron's sword juts up from the soil. So Black Center Voltron dramatically arises, a godlike monolith facing the evil tree. So we never saw Voltron turn to Black Center, but we knew it was yellow. And now coming up through, it's now Black Center again. And the shot of Voltron coming up in the sky and the camera looking up at him is pretty darn epic. It's it's a it's a there are times when uh Voltron is not uh the most doesn't have the coolest poses sometimes. This is one of those, oh yeah, that's awesome kind of poses. poses. <laughs> so Keith says, Lance, pick up Daniel, Alora, grab Lermina, on my mark, go. So Voltron charges at the evil tree, blazing sword in its hand. Uh, the evil tree uses its branches like arms to deflect Voltron's blows, then takes a swat at its head. Uh, as Voltron ducks to avoid the blow, its open uh, hand scoops up Daniel with an underhand catch. Larmina sprints wide, trying to avoid getting stepped on. Uh, Larmina stops short just as the blue lion opens up and she dives in. Alora says, Larmina, are you all right? And Larmina says, I was almost squashed like chewing gum under a giant shoe. Otherwise, fantastic. Laura says, I'm glad. Where's Barmy? Larmina says, oh, he's out there somewhere. Laura says, take the controls. So there's this part where uh, she flashed back to Alfor's advice in the in the script, but it never happened, right? Yeah, there was there was a line that Alfor gave when Alura was talking with him early in the episode. It was trimmed from the episode, and so the flashback to that trimmed dialogue also isn't in the episode. Right. So she just says, take the controls, and Larmina says, huh? Like, she never expected that Melora would hand over the controls of Blue Lion like that. Yeah. So Barmy is standing out in the open uh, and watching Voltron fight the evil tree, and Melora runs over to him, and he says, ah, princess, there you are. Is this a good time to talk? Alora oh, says, <laughs> Alora says, run now, talk later. And so the evil tree uh, flicks its branches, sends a pair of Hagarian pods flying at Black Center Voltron, ducks the first, hits the second with a sword. The Hagarian goo splatter acts like acid on the sword. Hitch says, Keith, we have to keep away from those pods. That liquid Hagarian will eat right through us. And Keith says, time to put that plant on ice. It's up to you, Alora. Form Blue Center. They don't realize that Alora's not in Blue Lion anymore, do they? No. I, you know, if, if they had Megazord instead of Voltron, they would have seen her leave the one cockpit that they're all sitting in. But right. uh, because she's down in Voltron's right foot, 
Only Larmina knows that she had left. Uh, and Larmina is saying, wait, I'm not. And then she says, well, what the heck? Uh, <laughs> she goes, ha, ah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to push my luck. Form Titanic Trident. So they formed Blue Center. Now they form Titanic Trident. So Voltron forms the dual-sided trident, spinning and stabbing it with Larmina-style freeze-blasting parts of the tree. And then Pitch says, whoa, Alora, where'd you learn those moves? And Larmina says, Alora's not here right now. Please leave a message and I'll be sure to get it to her as soon as I kick this tree stump. <laughs> and Keith says, Larmina? And then Pitch says, you up for another power surge? And he's talking to, to Vince. So Vince gives a, another power surge for Voltron. And Larmina says, butt kick boost. And in slow motion, Voltron does an acrobatic flipping spin kick. The um, trident shot at the, the tree. And basically, the whole tree is now cold, right? As ice. Yeah. yeah. And as she does her acrobatic flipping spin kick, it basically tears apart the tree into shards and frozen pods. And yeah, there's pretty much not, not, not a whole lot left after that. Yeah. So I gotta, I gotta add something real quick. When Larmina says the whole alert is not here right now, please leave a message. You know, it, it's so funny when we, it's really easy to watch Voltron defender of the universe and, and see dated pop culture references. Like, uh, I remember, uh, Zarkon making some, reference to uh oh some ice cream some cartoon ice cream mascot of the past which was even old by a defender of the universe's time um you know just just little references here and there and this one how many kids teens 20 somethings would know about answering machines today right <laughs> please leave me a message right oh well as the, the tree gets blown apart, obviously the drools that were there to capture the Hegarium, yeah. they're, le they're leaving in their ships now. And and Vince says, shouldn't we stop them? And Pitch says, nah, according to my sensors, they didn't collect a lot of Hegarium. So then we're in the Castle of Lions in the lair. Remember the lair? Yes, this looks nothing like the lair, by the way. The visual, I mean, it, it, I, I assume it is, but it looks like a, a space garage or a space lab or something. I mean, if this is the lair, which had been built in uh, a blown out hole in the wall in the catacombs of the Castle of Lions, uh, they done a lot of work on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Daniel says, yep, Larmina and I sort of spoiled the drool harvest. And Vince says, you're just lucky that Hagarium didn't drive you completely mad. Daniel says, okay, so maybe I wasn't myself. You can't tell anyone about this. They'll kick me off the force. And Larmina says, okay, we keep it quiet for now. And Vince says, I'll try to find a cure for you, Daniel, but until then you have to control this urge when it hits or we're all in trouble. So then we go to the Castle of Lions, Alora's quarters. Keith and Lance are having their own discussion with Alora. Keith says, I can't believe that you abandoned Blue to save that farmer. Alora says, I'd, I'd let him down too many times. I wasn't going to do it again. Lance says, Alora, you can't help everyone. You can't be everywhere at once. And Alora says, I know, which is why I've decided it's time for me to serve my people as the queen of Eris. Lance says, but you can't be queen as long as you're a member of the Voltron force. This, this was just what she was talking to her dad about, right? Mm -hmm, yep. So with a knowing smile, uh, Alora turns to Keith, whose look says he understands. Keith says, and to fill your seat in the blue lion? Alora says, I couldn't imagine anyone more ready. So then you see the great hall later that same night. Larmina's wearing her aunt's proud smile and her cadet Voltcom armor. So she's still got the gray cadet armor on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then you widen to reveal Alora standing beside her wearing her blue Voltcom armor. 
They hold up their arms so that their palms rest against each other and elbows touch. Both fold comms begin to glow. Armina's white, Alora's blue. Then Alora removes the blue key from her Voltcom, places it into Larmina's Voltcom. Alora's fingers intertwine with Larmina's and they tighten their grip. Then slowly the blue glow transfers to Larmina's Voltcom. Her armor becomes blue. And now she's got the same uniform, basically, that, that Alora has on. Yeah. And then she smiles. She is now the Blue Lion pilot. Alora says, welcome to the Voltron Force. They smile, salute each other, and then they hug. So there's some close-ups as other members of the team react. And then you see Vince, and he says, so I guess one of us is next. And then they close in on Daniel, who looks troubled, realizing that his condition could ruin his chances of ever joining the Force. And then they fade out. Yeah. So... uh a lot of stuff happens here. Uh, in addition to the evil tree uh, and another failed attempt by Lotor and Mayhawks to do bad stuff to Eris and Voltron, uh, Larmina has now succeeded Allura as pilot of Blue Lion. What do you think? So I I like the idea that they didn't go back to Lotor and Mayhawks at the end of this because there's an even bigger event happening, and that is... Finally, one of these cadets becomes a member of the Voltron Force. Yeah. yeah. And they yeah. made Lotor a big deal Mayhawks about it going, at the end. Yeah. I mean, going back to them, they would have just had a few little pithy lines of dialogue and maybe a, a little zinger from Mayhawks or something. But it would have completely nullified the impact of this scene. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So episode wise, what do you think? So, um, I mean, other than the whole Barmy's farm thing and trees just going haywire, you know, um, I, I think what it comes down to is the continuous stuff that keeps on happening from, from episode to episode at the end of this, this series. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the telepathy between uh, Vince and Daniel the Hagarium infection in Daniel. There's the growth of the cadets into Voltron Force members. Right. And now you're seeing a transition for Alora that we hadn't seen before, where she's now wants to be the Queen of Arras. Yeah. So you're questioning in your mind, who would be the next one? I mean, you, you always thought that maybe Daniel would take over for, for Black. You always thought that Vince would take over for Green. Right? Right. Right. So that's right. not necessarily how it could pan out. But yeah, you're right. 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 So it, it doesn't look like anybody's going to take over red or yellow is, is my point here. Sure. So Lance, Lance and Hunk would always be their lines. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think um, I would say the only criticism that I have of this episode, I, I mean, it's 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 standard fair for the most part, except it, it's the framework that they hang the plot stuff on. You know what yeah. I, mean? I mean? The evolution of the Voltron Force as Larmina becomes the new blue pilot and all that. I mean, it, it's other than that, it's it's pretty standard action stuff. They, they, there's not much from the villains. It doesn't really add anything to the villains plot arc. Um, it's pretty much, you know, we got our framework of action and here's the plot. Here's the, the, the arc moving on. It works fine as a standard action show. I, I actually kind of like the tree angle. It's, it's unique for this series. I just wish that the Hagarium infection thing were more clearly explained. If, if not in this episode, then certainly in I Voltron, something between that episode, maybe the one in between, or this one, something that makes that connection a lot more obvious. Because there we don't even see Daniel ever get the explanation of where he would have gotten the Sagarium infection from. Did he just divine this information himself after he was told Hagarium's gonna do bad stuff to you? Did they just tell him off screen? What's going on? I I, I don't know. And that and the way they revealed it by a, a flashback of a clip of Daniel's mind in Voltron is really confusing, I think, in the context of this episode. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, it's a fun action story. I do think that uh, 
Barmy is a little too Jed or Jethro Clampett. Uh, but he is a comical character, and it does add some levity to the story. Um, I also do think that fo- that whole force field thing, as as a as as a way to stop the Robies from doing the worst thing it could possibly do on Eris, which is get to the core of the planet, it was resolved very quickly and in a very confusing way. And yeah, but other than that, it worked all right. <laughs> okay, so um, I. I don't know if you could compare uh, Daniel's Hagarium infection with what Sven had in Ghost in the Lion. That's a really good question. I, they, I, I guess it. I guess that episode gives us some taste of what Daniel might experience in the future. I don't. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I was just wondering because Sven really it was it was really impacting him. I mean, he was. He was making some very rash decisions. We started seeing Daniel do similar things in this episode. Your thoughts about Daniel, about the other Voltron Force cadets keeping this secret from the rest of the team? Yeah, I don't think that's a smart move at all. No. I I don't understand the reason for it either. I just just think you guys are being very um, uh, irresponsible. By, by yeah, not yeah. letting the rest of the team know this? Yeah. I would argue that they're being less responsible now than they were in the earliest episodes because now they're at the 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 moment where any of them, like Larmina, could become the ne- a, a new Voltron Force pilot. So for them to be keeping secrets like this, something this vital to Eris, to the Voltron Force, to the universe that Voltron ostensibly defends... Uh, keeping a secret of this magnitude is not the wisest choice. And and if you know what they were planning on doing with season two, you can see that this is one of the biggest things that happens. That is the reason why, you know, things would have happened the way they did in season two. And, yeah. you know, that's it's it's always those things where people either are not being honest or they're doing things behind other people's backs or something like that, that causes the most strife in a team, you know, where right, team right. is, you, you count on the other people on your team. And if they're not being completely honest with you, it's like not everybody's working together. Right, and you can right. see what, what happens to a team when they don't work together and when they keep things from each other or secrets or whatever like that, it, it can ruin a whole thing. And it's those types of things that if you think about like a musical band, like, you know, the Beatles or, you know, any band that you can think of out there, why did those bands break up? Why, you know, what was the things that, that caused these wonderful teams to break up? And a lot of it happens to, to do with, the the trust between the members in the team and they don't trust each other and they don't want to work with each other anymore. Yeah. So I, I'm glad you said that and not Hagarium. Like that's what broke up the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Hagarium infection. Oh. It must have happened to Ringo. Oh yeah. Oh Ringo. Anyway, you know I I think this is a fun episode overall. Like I said, there there are a couple things that uh, I wasn't too fond of then or now, but but overall, it's a fun story, and and it is neat to see Larmina. I she is the first person, easily the first person of the three, uh, who deserves to and is ready. I think to move on. So uh, that was neat to see. Yeah, but she still doesn't like the fact that she has to meet with all the the the, the citizens in the People's Forum. That's true. (laughs) Yeah. She's still got some growing to do. Especially when the citizens break in past the security guards. Yeah, the the invisible security guards, right? right. That we never see. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, we have a few more episodes to go before we're done here. And, of course, we also want to help celebrate the 40th anniversary of Ultron. We have VoltCon coming up, so there's all kinds of things to finish out the year here. That's right. So uh, 
Uh, if you've made it this far, fellow Voltron fans, thanks for joining us in this episode of Let's Voltron. And uh, please stick with us. We've got some good stuff coming up ahead as well. Oh, yeah. So we'll see you all next time on Let's Voltron. <laughs>